Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's give it up for Thea and all the good work she does. Thank you uh, to Thea Lee. And I am glad to be off of Capitol Hill right now and with all of you uh, as we plan what we need to do uh, as we go forward uh, in the coming years on Capitol Hill. And I want to, in addition to thanking Thea, thank her, her whole team at the Economic Policy Institute uh, for the work that you do. Uh, that brings the needs of everyday families into the discussion of economic policy. Sometimes, as all of you know, we have a lot of economic policy wonks in the room. It can get really, it can be dry. We need to make it alive and real, and that's what you do at EPI in terms of the impact in the lives of working Americans. And you also prov provide that rigorous and trustworthy uh, information uh, that we all need uh, as we take on the myths and a lot of the falsehoods that are perpetrated uh, by very powerful special interests uh, who are trying to craft the tax code and economic policy generally uh, to serve their interests uh, at the expense of the interests of the American uh, public. So I want to thank you, um, EPI, for hosting us today. I want to thank all the folks at Americans for Tax Fairness, uh, as well as others in this room uh, who have contributed your ideas and talents uh, to this very important uh, conversation. And we have to push back, and we have to push back very hard, because we know that Donald Trump and the Republicans in Congress are pushing some of those economic myths and falsehoods uh, just as hard as they possibly can. Uh, they use the so-called Laffer Curve, uh, which Art Laffer uh, drew on a napkin for Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld in 1974. They've used that to claim that tax cuts for the rich somehow pay for themselves. Uh, of course, we know that uh, the Trump tax cuts do not pay for themselves, and what the Laffer curve ideolo ideology, and it is ideology, uh, not economics, what that has done is increase economic inequality and add trillions of dollars uh, to our national debt. Now, you may have seen that Donald Trump gave Art Laffer a Presidential Medal of Freedom. I would say, I would say a much better symbol for trickle-down economics is the Laffer Curve napkin in the Smithsonian. Uh, I don't know if you saw the article, uh, but it turns out that the napkin at the Smithsonian is not the real Laffer napkin. Uh, in fact, it was a napkin he made several years after the fact. Uh, so what we know is that that napkin is a fake and tri trickle-down economics is a fraud. And we need all of you. But just because it's a fraud doesn't mean it hasn't been applied, because it has, and it's created a lot of damage at the expense of working families. So it's really important that we come together and we think of ways to fairly raise the revenues we need to invest in an economy that brings opportunity um, and fair wages and benefits uh, to uh, the American uh, people. And that's what this is all about. So let's take a, a look at the economy. Uh, it is, of course, good news that the economy has been growing for 10 years, but while many economists like to focus on the aggregate growth rates uh, within our economy, people in this room know that the aggregate numbers often hide the economic hardship being experienced by millions of our fellow Americans. After all, if Bill Gates uh, walked into this room right now, our aggregate income growth would skyrocket and on average, we would all be multi-millionaires. Uh, so aggregate numbers and averages often hide the real world economic hardship uh, being experienced by American families. And a recent report by the Federal Reserve that many of you have seen uh, reinforced uh, that reality. Um, it stressed the financial fragility facing American families despite uh, the strong economy and those average uh, numbers. Here's just one finding from the report that 39% of adults uh, in America cannot cover an emergency expense of $400 without borrowing 
or selling something, and that's if they can do one or the other of those things at all. So that's a staggering percentage um, and fact uh, to think about uh, at a time when you know, people think economic, the economy is, is doing great. The reality is it's uh, not doing great for tens of millions of Americans. So while the economy is growing, and if we're not seeing shared prosperity, the question, of course, is where is all that money going? And uh, it's not a surprise to people in this room to find out that it's going not just to the rich, but to the very, very rich and the very wealthy in this country. In 1979, the top one-tenth of 1% 1 received 4% of our national income. So the top one-tenth of 1% 1 had a 4% share of the national income. Today, that figure has more than doubled to 10%. So the top 0.1% now receive 10% of our total national income. And when you look at wealth inequality, you see an even worse situation, even larger disparity. In 1979, if you look at the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of Americans, they owned 77% 7 of the wealth in the United States. Uh, by 2016, that figure had skyrocketed to 19%. So the top one one-thousandth of Americans control 19%, 19% of America's wealth. And if you look at those very wealthy households, uh, you'll find they make money in a very different way than most Americans because most of the money they make comes from the money they already have rather than from their work. Uh, if you look at the bottom 9% of income earners, bottom 90% of income earners, investment gains do not tend to be a large source of their income. That's not surprising, uh, but when you look at the figures, they're pretty stark uh, because for the bottom 90% of income earners, uh, income from investments uh, comes to about 15% of their total income, whereas for the top 0.1%, and I'm talking 0.1% here, a full 67%, 67% of their income derives from investment gains generated by their massive wealth. So people making money off of money they already have uh, rather than money off of hard work. And so that's where the income gains are going primarily, to the already very rich, both in terms of income and in wealth. And of course, uh, the stock buybacks that we saw in the aftermath of the Trump uh, tax cuts uh, just reinforced uh, that pattern, close to $2 trillion uh, in stock buybacks, which contrasts very distinctly from some of the patterns we saw in the aftermath of World War Two, uh, where we know that the paychecks of most workers uh, tracked the increase in productivity. So as workers worked harder and they provided productivity gains, that that productivity gain was captured in increasing wages uh, for those uh, workers. Uh, but since the mid-1970s, and I'm sure many of you have seen those charts, uh, there's that great disparity between worker productivity uh, and wages uh, for workers. And even though since the mid-1970s, worker productivity has increased by 77%, uh, pay for non-managerial workers has risen by just 12%. So the benefit of that increased productivity has not gone to the workers. Uh, it's gone to uh, the big corporations uh, and their owners. So we need to confront this problem with solutions. Uh, we need to build a dynamic economy that works for everybody uh, rather than a dynastic economy based on existing wealth. And that needs to be our, our goal. So I just want to mention some of the proposals that uh, I'm going to be introducing in Congress, some I've introduced. And there are lots of good ideas out there. And the key is for us to coalesce around uh, some uh, major uh, proposals uh, so that 
uh, when there's a majority in Congress, and that will be sooner rather than later, uh, to get this done, uh, we'll be able to uh, hit the ground running. So I, I would start with a proposal that uh, you've discussed today uh, for a 10% surtax on incomes above $2 million. Uh, that corresponds uh, to the top 0.1% of the income range that I was talking about earlier. So we're talking about a surtax on one of every 1,000 uh, households. Uh, and I will be introducing uh, that legislation later this summer. Um, <laughs> unlike the existing tax system, this surtax, this surtax on very high income earners, uh, will not give special treatment to people who make their money off of money uh, compared to people who make their money from work. Uh, the surtax will apply equally uh, to labor and investment income. And to make sure that the wealthiest family dynasties pay their share of this surtax, this legislation will pair the surtax with provisions to close a major loophole that wealthy households use to shield their investments from income taxes, uh, the so-called stepped-up basis uh, provision in the law. We will close that down. Here's how, they, how, here's how it works right now, right? Normally when you sell an investment, um, whether it's stock or some other kind of investment, uh, you pay capital gains on the profit that you make uh, at sale. But when someone holds that investment, like a stock, uh, until they pass away, uh, their heirs inherit the asset without anyone ever paying income taxes on the gains that accrued during that person's lifetime. Uh, in fact, if you look at the estates worth more than $100 million, you will find that 55%, 55% of that value has never been subject uh, to a tax and never will because of stepped up basis. Uh, so as we work with tax experts to design provisions to close uh, this loophole, uh, we will start uh, with something that uh, President Obama had put forward in his budget uh, that contained a similar measure to close the loopholes, but also made sure we put some provisions in place to protect truly middle-class households and truly uh, family-owned farms and businesses. And I think it's important when we talk about uh, generating more revenue uh, to build an economy that works for everybody that we also let the American public know how we intend to invest these dollars in order to build uh, an economy uh, that works for everyone. And I propose to direct the revenues uh, generated uh, from this uh, surtax uh, to funding uh, a piece of legislation that uh, I've introduced already called Keep Our Pact Act. What does that mean? It stands for Keep Our Promises to America's Children and Teachers. And what it will do is address a huge shortfall in federal funding for education K through 12. Let me give you a couple facts here, uh, because if you look at the root of our education funding system, and I'm referring to our K through 12 education funding system, it is based on a fundamental inequality, which is that in the United States, um, we developed a system where the property tax is the primary funding source for our schools. Well, not surprisingly, if you come from a relatively wealthy community, you're gonna be able to generate a lot more revenue for educating the kids in your school system. Uh, whereas lower uh, income neighborhoods do not have that capacity. Now, state government and federal government is supposed to address that fundamental inequality. Uh, but we are falling woefully short uh, at the federal level. I just want to give you a couple figures uh, to highlight that point. If you look at the formula, this is for a Title I. Title I funding is the main source of federal funding to correct this in inequity. If you look at the funding formula in law, it would have authorized funding for Title I schools at $48.7 billion in 2017. 
$48.7 billion. Instead, Title I was funded at just $15.4 billion. That is a $33 billion one-year shortfall in the federal government's commitment to K-12 education in the United States of America. We have the formula in law, but what happens is whatever money is appropriated, it just gets prorated. So although our law says we're authorizing K through 12 at what we think is necessary to provide a quality education for every child, we are shortchanging them in a massive way. If you look at the special education funding formula, you'll find the same thing. This is the IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. A very good thing Congress did back in the 1970s, saying every child should get a, an equal education regardless of disability. And Congress made a commitment at that time to fund special education at 40% of what, it, what the cost would be. They said, this is not gonna be an unfunded mandate. We're gonna, we're gonna share uh, with local school districts in the cost of meeting this common goal. Well, if you look at the funding for IDA today, it's not at 40%, it's at about 15% in terms of the federal share uh, to the costs. And what does that translate into real dollars? Well, if we'd been at the 40% promised level in 2017, it would have been $33.5 billion from the federal government, uh, but Congress appropriated about $12 billion. So that's a shortfall in one year for special ed at $21 billion. And of course, when schools are shortchanged on special ed funding, it means they have less funding overall uh, to meet the needs of our kids uh, and their educational uh, requirements. Uh, and if you look at just a 12 years, over the last 12 years, which is, you know, not first grade through 12th grade, uh, if you look at the shortfall in Title I and IDA funding over that period of time, it comes to a whopping $580 billion. So we have lots of conversations at the local level in terms of class sizes and teacher pay and trying to make sure that our kids are getting ad adequate education when uh, the federal government is by its own measure falling hugely short of what we as a country said would be uh, required. So I propose to make those investments um, using some of the additional revenues uh, generated through the SUR tax. And I should point out this bill uh, has become a top priority. Um, I've introduced this bill for many years, but it is now um, uh, getting some important attention. Uh, it's the top priority of the National Education Association, the American Federation of Teachers. There's an alliance to reclaim our schools. Uh, it's supported by the National Urban League, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, and many other uh, civil rights organizations who believe that if we're gonna really meet the dictates of Brown versus Board of Education, uh, we need to deal with this fundamental uh, inequity. So let me also now turn to another uh, group of Americans that is often uh, forgotten, and those are people who are long-term unemployed. So for the economists in the room who follow it, we have a definition of what it means to be long-term unemployed. It's somebody who's been out of a job and looking for work for six months. If you're not looking for work over the last six months, you're not actually counted in the technical definition of long-term unemployed. But if you think about it, uh, the economy um, is doing relatively well overall compared to what it was 10 years ago. Uh, and yet, even in this economy, we have 1.3 million people who are out of work and have been looking for work for uh, over six months. And what happens when you start to fall into that category is you become harder and harder to employ as time goes on because employers look at that um, as one of the factors in making their hiring. So the challenge gets harder and harder for the long-term uh, unemployed. So I've teamed up with Senator Ron Wyden. Uh, just this week, we introduced the Long-Term Unemployment Elimination Act. Uh, this bill will generate real job opportunities for anyone who is long-term unemployed. How do we do it? Uh, we propose that the federal government will cover 
two-thirds of the costs of wages and benefits for these jobs for a one-year period, and then in some cases where that job is leading to a particular certif certif certificate in a particular skill, uh, extend that up for two years. And the idea is to get these individuals who want to work into the workplace, on their feet, and into the uh, overall economy, as opposed to the Republican approach, which is, well, for people out of work, we just want to take away some of their benefits, right? If you're not working, we're going to punish you, the Republicans say, by denying you access to things like food nutrition programs. But if you're looking for work for six months and can't find it, it's not your fault uh, that there's not a job out there for you. So this idea is to really make sure we get these individuals who have been really left behind into the workforce uh, on their feet. And I hope you'll all have a chance to take a look at um, that legislation. That bill, uh, Senator Wyden and I proposed to fund by closing some of the outrageous uh, overseas tax breaks that were included in the uh, 2017 uh, tax bill, which actually took the problem of encouraging businesses to move overseas even worse. In other words, that legislation created even more incentives for U.S. corporations and businesses to move their plant and equipment overseas. And unless we fix this, we will begin to see that uh, happen uh, because it's, it, it will be in their self-interest uh, to do so. So uh, I've co-sponsored legislation along with Senator Whitehouse and Senator Klobuchar and Senator Duckworth to close down uh, some of those uh, big loopholes. And instead of incentivizing U.S. companies to move their plant and equipment overseas, let's shut down that loophole and use that revenue to help put these long-term individu unemployed individuals back to work right here in the United States of America. <laughs> Finally, I want to address uh, one other uh, you know, tax break that we need to uh, address, um, and that relates to the estate tax. Um, we need to, as, as all of you know, that if you look at the 2017 law, uh, Republicans provided a big giveaway to the wealthiest uh, estates uh, in the country. Uh, and the reality is that uh, Republicans continue to pretend that the uh, estate tax, as it was, <laughs> somehow um, impacts lots of Americans. Uh, simply false, like the Laffer curve. Um, less than 1% of estates in this country uh, pay any kind of estate tax. Less than 1% of estates uh, under the earlier formulation uh, pay any estate tax. And of course, it's intended to prevent the rise of a permanent aristocracy uh, in the country, but as the figures I cited earlier show, uh, we are building a bigger, bigger aristocracy every day uh, when you have the top 0.1% of the country controlling 19 percent uh, of uh, the nation's wealth. So uh, I introduced a bill today uh, to take the estate tax levels back to where they were uh, before the uh, Trump tax uh, giveaway uh, to these big dynasties. And it's got a very simple title appropriate, appropriate for today. It's the strengthen, because I'm going to use this funds for Social Security strengthening, Strengthen Social Security by Taxing Dynastic Wealth Act. Um, and uh, look, uh, what we would do is uh, take the estate, back, estate tax back to where it was, as I said, which, which still means that the first 3.5 million of someone's estate is exempt from estate taxes. That's down from where the Republicans raised it to, which is $11.4 million. Uh, and the legislation would also take the estate tax rate uh, back up to 45% uh, from a 40%. And the idea of investing uh, funds from the state tax to provide retirement security um, has an interesting uh, and long pedigree. Um, first of all, more recently, I mean in the last uh, couple decades, Nancy Altman, uh, who is the president of Social Security Works, has advocated for this proposal. 
before uh, Nancy, uh, Bob Ball, who was our nation's longest Social Security Commissioner, uh, proposed that we direct revenues from the estate tax uh, to Social Security. Uh, and if you go way back, Thomas Paine, in a pamphlet entitled Agrarian Justice, advocated an estate tax to fund payments to the elderly and people with disabilities. So you see that this has a, a distinguished um, heritage. And here's what Thomas Paine said, quote, it is from overgrown acquisition of property that the fund will support itself. In other words, use the estate tax revenue to support uh, this retirement uh, fund. And that's exactly uh, what the bill I introduced today will do. Now, this one measure uh, will close 21% uh, of the total long range shortfall in the Social Security Trust Fund. So it obviously is not the entire solution, uh, but it is a piece of it when you can address 20% uh, of the shortfall, 21% of the shortfall. And we know uh, that Social Security is one of the, if not the most successful anti-poverty programs in the country, uh, without it, 22.1 million more Americans would be in poverty uh, today. Now, uh, it's important to understand that uh, Republicans keep claiming that um, in order to prevent Social Security from running out of its funds, that we need to cut benefits uh, to millions and millions of Americans, uh, but that simply is not true. Uh, the provision I've introduced shows one piece of that puzzle, uh, but I've also introduced legislation along with Senator Blumenthal in the United States Senate and uh, the leader in the House, John Larson, the leader of this bill in the House, John Larson, called the Social Security 2100 Act, uh, which shows very clearly that you can extend uh, Social Security solvency for at least the next 75 years uh, while also increasing uh, benefits. So I take a, encourage you to take a look at that legislation uh, as well. Uh, but if you take these two uh, bills together, it's just an example of the options that we have uh, to shore up the Social Security system and make sure uh, that it continues to um, meet the goals that it was, uh, it was established to meet. The last thing I just want, want to mention is um, the financial transactions tax, as you all saw. Senator Sanders introduced something uh, the other day. Uh, Senator Brian Schatz and I uh, have previously uh, introduced uh, legislation to have create a, what we call a, a Wall Street tax uh, because that's what it is. It's a, a very small fee uh, on a lot of different uh, Wall Street uh, transactions. And the Tax Policy Center estimates that that uh, bill that we introduced um, excuse me, they, 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 they have found that nearly one-fourth, so 25% of all the revenues generated uh, by such a Wall Street tax would come from the top 0.1% of Americans, almost as much as the tax would collect from every household uh, in the bottom 20, bottom 80% combined. So uh, what we have is an enormous amount of very risky trading and speculation on Wall Street, uh, and in, additional in addition to raising money, uh, putting this fee on those transactions would cut down significantly on those risky uh, trading uh, practices, uh, which uh, we all may end up paying for in a different way uh, if we don't uh, take some kind of measure. So uh, lots of things we should uh, be pressing for um, in order to build an economy that really does uh, work for everybody. Uh, we can generate the revenue we need to invest uh, in our kids' education, uh, to invest in other uh, major uh, policies uh, that will help uh, lift everybody up uh, and make sure everybody has a fair shot. So thank you very much uh, for being part of that effort. And now let's just go out, work hard, and get it done. Thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I don't know if you want to ask questions. It's up to you. you want, it's up to you. I'm happy to answer if you, if you okay. want. It's up to Great. Well, your time on it. That was an extraordinarily comprehensive and impressive legislative agenda. And actually, I think really sets us up for the afternoon where we're going to talk about how to get it done. But uh, I think Senator Van Hollen has time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, but be concise and ask a question and identify yourselves. Uh, there are some microphones out in the audience. Um, they're coming. Okay. Microphones coming. be doing to effectively make this happen because with Senator McConnell controlling the agenda this stuff doesn't even make it to the floor so you know the thing here's here's my view on this um, it is it is true that if you look at today's Senate um, this legislation uh, would not uh, escape uh, Mitch McConnell's uh, grip but I'm a very big believer uh, in the fact that uh, we need to uh, lay the groundwork with not just concepts uh, but specific legislative proposals that lets people look very clearly at what we intend to do so uh, they can't be easily scared by, you know, the, the opposition. I mean, I think if people look at the details of the proposals that I outlined, uh, I could take this to, you know, 80 percent, well, in fact, probably 99 percent of the country, but a big, my, my point is an overwhelming majority of the country. And it's important to do this work now, uh, both to set forth the vision so people around the country can see what we would do, um, but also so that uh, when we take back a majority, we're not then just figuring out how to do this and we're ready to do the work. Now, in, obviously, in order to pass it, you need the votes. I mean, look, I've always said, you know, if you want to do good policy, you've got to get the politics right. You have to win elections. Uh, and the reality is that it, we have to, in order to accomplish this, uh, we'd have to win the White House, um, and we have to make uh, gains and have a majority in the United States Senate. Um, you know, in the, in the Senate, um, you, if, for those of you who've been following it, uh, it's, it's a very close. It's definitely winnable uh, for the Democrats, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to require fighting um, in some of these key states uh, around the country. And, of course, the same is true for the White House. So you're right, without, without uh, you know, winning, uh, we're not going to be able to put this agenda uh, in place. But my belief is this is a winning agenda. We just need to get out there and talk about it. All right? Thank you.